The teaching and learning department has been busy because when you are buying instructional materials, you just can't go, I'll take this one, this one, this one, this one. I mean, there's just a lot of work to go into the process. So we want to explain to you what the process is so you are comfortable with our choices. So I'm going to introduce Mr. John Martell. He's going to go through a part of the process for you. Mr. Martell? I guess I'll be talking to you too. <laughs> Now, uh, so what happens is, is that when we go through adopting uh, materials for the district, TEA, which is Texas Education Agency, uh, makes us follow some protocols. So what happened in the past was, is that the commissioner would look at what? Uh, the commissioner would look at your numbers, and but basically what they did is they had publishers come and they would present their materials. TEA would say, guess what? These materials are good. They line up with our curriculum, which we call the TEKS. And they would show those materials to the districts, and the districts would choose those. That has changed. So what happens is, is now we have an instructional maintenance allotment. We have an IMA specialist. And because of what's gone on um, in the last couple of years, with books kind of fading out and technology coming in, they give you funding for this. And how you use your funding is kind of similar to the old process. The stuff has to be approved by TEA. It has to align with our TEKS. But you have a little more freedom in what you can do and what you can choose. So it gives between textbooks and digital resources, and it becomes very complex. So we have to be careful how we spend our monies because we only have a certain amount of monies, again, based on attendance and enrollment. Um, and without any more to say, I'm going to introduce you to our one and only IMA specialist, <laughs> Carolyn Edwards. Hi, I guess I'm going to speak to you as well. It's going to be easy for me because I'm pretty nervous about speaking in front of everyone. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to run through the timeline just a little bit for you of what we've done just a little bit and then also kind of cover what we just, just done last month. Uh, September, October, November, curriculum groups met. That was our coordinators. And you'll see Michael and Sandra a little bit later uh, present that, explain process to our teachers, encourage our teachers to commit and review materials. And then in October, I kind of come on the scene. And what happens with that is uh, they give me vendors that are publishers that they're interested in, and I send out information to these publishers and request that they come and, and um, show their materials to us so our teachers can uh, view these materials. And this year we had quite a few, uh, quite a few publishers to come. We had publishers from Hoff Mifflin, uh, Springboard, McGraw-Hill, Pearson, um, lots and lots of social studies and math. Uh, we had them from National Geographic, uh, Nystrom, uh, Teachers Creating Materials, uh, Social Studies Weekly. And what happens is they send samples to us like in October. And then what the coordinators do is they meet with their, their teachers and go through all these materials in October. And so then January, we have the teachers, they have another opportunity to come and actually meet with these publishers, view the materials. And this year we probably had about 50 to 75 50 to 60 people come out and view. It's a two-day viewing. Social studies was on uh, January 27th, a Tuesday night, and math was on January 29th, a uh, <coughs> Thursday night. And uh, we collaborated with Angleton, uh, not Angleton, with Danbury High School, uh, Sherry Phillips, and their teachers came over as well. They're a smaller district, so it's kind of important to kind of collaborate. So we did that with them and encouraged their teachers to come over. Um, they came over and viewed all of this and had a good time, got lots of free stuff. You know, we sent all kinds of messages out to our teachers because there's like all kinds of free samples that these teachers get and they can actually view them. We invite the community to come out as well and uh, they have an opportunity to take books and samples and everything. We had some uh, young people from junior high to work with us this year as volunteers and they were excited because they took some books home that they think they're going to be looking at next year as freshmen. So uh, that was really exciting. And so after that happens, here we are in February through March, and it goes back over to the coordinators again, and so they're actually, um, uh, we're getting ready to do that. We haven't done that yet. We'll be presenting recommendations with adoption to the IMA committee. We'll be doing that uh, this week, and also to the EIC, uh, the EIC. And then in April, you can see that we'll uh, present recommendations for adoption to the Board of Trustees. And then April through August, I come back in again because I'm responsible for ordering all the materials making sure that there's enough money there. The system closes as an ordering time that we can actually order materials, and so it opens back up between April and May. And um, 
at that point, I guess the coordinators go back and they'll start training the teachers. And hopefully by August, we'll be distributing materials. We had a little bit of an issue this year that materials came in late. And we were not able to get all the materials out to kids uh, right before school started. So we hope to do a better job of that this year. And um, that's it. Any questions? Thank you. I'm Sandra Consilio. I am the K-12 math coordinator for the district. Um, and I'm just going to take a few minutes and look at Proclamation 2014, which is the adoption that we did last school year. And so for that adoption, we, um, we looked at K-12 science. They had a new adoption, new materials in the classroom. We did math K-8, and the reason we only did K-8 math last year is because the standards in the classroom change this year for those students. The math standards in high school change next year, and they'll have their new textbooks this year, that same year coming up. And then we also did technology applications and bought a program, learning.com. Um, and so the students are using that in the classroom also for technology, learning to be a good digital citizen, and using that through uh, their computer time. Um, the adoption that we did last year is good for eight years, and currently we have two years of print. Um, and then reevaluate our digital and print options after those two years. Um, and so hopefully we'll for a transitional part through there. So what does a digital lesson look like? Because we talked a lot about the digital part of the adoption. And so when we are looking at just two years of print, after those two years that would be, if we don't purchase additional print, then we would have digital lessons that we'd have to use. So let's look in real quick. Um, this was the adoption that we purchased for K-5 math last year. It's Go Texas. It actually goes up, uh, Texas Go Math, sorry. It goes up to K-8. This is what the K-5 books look like. But the teachers have access to the book that they, the hard bound book, the print book that they would get. They actually have it online. Um, so they have their chapters. It's divided up by the strands, just as the state test is. They have their lessons within there. Um, and then they can also use videos to help them with the lesson. They have their, their handouts that they need in there. They can assign products to the students, which I'll show you that part in just a second as well. One of the nice components about the Texas Go Math, the adoption that we went with last year, is these five buttons across the bottom here, the green, blue, purple, orange, and red, those are actually our, our 5E. So our instructional model in BISD is the 5E lesson model for math, science, and social studies, and balanced literacy in ELA. And so each of those dots as they progress through the video is addressing one of those instructional areas that we've looked at in our instructional model. Some other tools that they have here, um, the teachers can interact on their whiteboards with the Mimeo bar that they have. And so they can pull up base 10 cubes, they can pull up fraction bars, any type of graphing pattern blocks, they can actually pull those straight up from their digital textbook and manipulate those on the board with this, on the screen with the students. Um, another option they have within their digital resource <coughs> is a glossary of all the math terms that they need to know for that grade level or specifically just for that lesson. Um, once they get through uh, the first three buttons, the first three parts of the 5E model, they go into the evaluate and the elaborate, and they have the personal math trainer, which assesses and provides them with some more opportunity to check for understanding. And so they're giving basic the question just as they would see it in a worksheet or in a handout, but they have it on their computer. They can assign these to the students. If the students get stuck with it, they can ask her step by step. So it's going to tell them, step one, this is what you need to do. Are you still stuck? Here's step two. Try this. Um, if they need the math on the spot video, those are done by Dr. Berger. He is the president of university in San Marcos. Which one is it? Thank you. <laughs> um, so he does all of the math on the spot videos. A lot of our high schoolers are already familiar with him, but these videos actually go all the way down to kindergarten. Um, and so he has videos for every lesson, every content, there's a video that goes with it. So they can also watch the video if they have trouble with that. They can actually go straight into the textbook and see the notes on that content, and this is what I'm working on. So they can either, they have three options now. They can see step by step, they can watch a video, or they can read it themselves. So lots, addressing lots of different learning styles. 
Um, they also have the toolkit, which was the toolkit we saw a minute ago that had the graphing, the pattern blocks, the uh, fraction bars, the base 10 blocks, so they can pull up their own manipulative tools that they can use on their own screen. And if they have to, they can print it. It doesn't have to be on the computer. Everything is printable as well. They get immediate feedback with their check their answer, and then they can move on to their next question. So this is what it looks like when it's in the hands of the students. So I hacked into my son's account. I'll open up in here. And so when he logs in, this is his dashboard. All of his books for ELA, because ELA, their past adoption, was under the same publisher, so their books are under his account. He has his math books under this account, and he has his science books under his this account. And that's for eight years. So starting in kinder on until he's seventh grade, that's my daughter, but he has this until they're eighth grade and beyond. So the same program, learning it and using it year after year. Um, the library here is where the books are stored. His teacher can go in and assign him homework, and he can pull this up, do the homework on his Chromebook, on his device, and submit it to her. She checks it, and then it can go back into his scores, where it tells him how he did. And so he gets that immediate feedback in his scores. So a couple different options that they have. They don't have to be bound to that book. They can have those. There's different ways to do it within the technology. All right. Any questions on Proclamation 2014? My name is Michael Williams. I'm the social studies coordinator for the district. And uh, last year I was also involved in the, the math adoption with Sandra. Uh, so last year, Proclamation 2014, we adopted uh, for, for K-8 math, K-12 uh, science. Those were the, the two big ones in our core academic areas. This time around, finally getting some love for social studies. It's been 12 long years uh, since social studies got new resources. This is my 10th year in the district. Same books I started with are the same books we have now, and they were old when I got them. They looked like they'd been chewed on by kids. So we're really excited. My social studies teachers are extremely excited about getting new resources in social studies. As, as Carolyn explained, uh, this is a year uh, of, of review process. We've actually been looking uh, for months. And one of the, uh, the real positives uh, with uh, the digital access is that our publishers, our, our major publishers of, of McGraw-Hill, Houghton Mifflin, Pearson, uh, they have opened up their, their products digitally and are allowing our teachers to, and some of them back even in October, allowing our teachers to uh, sign up for demo accounts. But normally when you think of demo account, you think it's just a, a little component, it's a little piece, you only have a 30-day trial. They've actually opened those up, the full resources where teachers can go in and assign I think, uh, assign assignments to their kids. Kids can take assessments on there, uh, show the videos. Uh, and our teachers have been using them, uh, many of my teachers have been using those in the class uh, for several months. So that it's not just a matter of which one comes in the shinier box, which one has the, the nice test generator disc, uh, but actually trying them out in our classes and seeing what, what works well. So with our new instructional materials, uh, kindergarten through 12th grade in social studies will be adopting. And when we finish up, if you want to take a look over on, on that back table by the, by the aerial photo, uh, there are just a random sampling of, of some of the social studies materials that we're looking at. Um, for 6th grade through 12th grade, uh, there, there is a, a, the traditional textbook component, uh, but there's also the digital side of that textbook. And when you go to the, when you go to the textbook digitally, then you're reading it online, but there's also, there are also interactive pieces. There, there are, uh, you know, you're reading a text about Machu Picchu, and lo and behold, click on here, and there up pops the video where you as a student can see the video. And then normally you'd have to uh, wait for your teacher to show you in class, but you can see it on your own. Or there are uh, questions that maybe at the end of the, the chapter, you know, at the end of every section you get those questions uh, in a typical textbook. Well, digitally, they can do those uh, questions, uh, you know, they can write in their di kind of digital notebook and submit those uh, to their teachers or save them uh, in their notes. Uh, we are looking at K-5. K-5 is a different uh, setup um, with the publishers and a lot of that is more consumable focus. So as we're looking through what we're going to adopt, we have to consider uh, longevity. Uh, besides 
considering quality and co considering alignment and cost, those sorts of things. We also have to look at what technology we have in the district, where we're going with technology, uh, how long that might take, uh, how, how easy it is for our kiddos to access at school, how easy it is for them to access at home. So there are a lot of things to, to be con uh, considered. Mr. Martell alluded to the fact that in the, the good old days, uh, the state would bring you three or four textbooks, plop them down on the table, everybody just kind of go around, pick the shiny one, and that's what you went with. And the state would just give you those books. That's kind of how it worked. Now the system is the state gives you some money, a bucket of money, probably not enough. They give you some money, and they say, you have more options. Here are things that are on the list. This is 100% aligned. Here are other things you could buy. Here, here are things in print. Here are things that are digital. And so it gives a lot more opportunity. A lot, there are a lot more options out there, but it's, it's, a, it's a more complex process to go through that. Mathematics, uh, high school math is adopting as well, uh, and that does include Algebra 1 at 8th grade, because that's an, that is a high school class. That is, even though it's 8th grade, that is a high school credit class. If you're interested in some of the samples, some of the resources, uh, we have a few uh, high school uh, samples set up over here. And then uh, Fine Arts is adopting. Do you have, want to add a bit? Sure. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, as Michael mentioned, this is also a fine arts adoption year. And I believe it's also been 12 years since we've adopted. And there's been some really great things that have come out to help things that our fine arts people are doing. Um, I want to talk first about visual art. Um, the only publisher that has published anything for uh, visual art, that's painting, sculpture, uh, collage, welding, whatever you want to do with art, is Davis, which was also the only publisher that published last time. Now, the big buzzword in all this is digital. So Davis has a textbook, and then they also have 30,000 images. Now, there's good parts and bad parts. When you pick up the Davis textbook, it's very similar to the Davis textbook that are already in all of our classrooms. Mm -hmm. And apparently, we're not the only school district that thought that. The 30,000 images, are, we have copy, if you buy in, you have copyright and all this kind of wonderful stuff. That's what we really want. So we went back to Davis and said, is it possible for us to do the 30,000 images? and just keep our old textbooks, because basically the new ones are just the same one with a new cover. And, you know, because all those new books, if we bought them, the biggest thing they'd be is just a storage problem. So um, at first they were reluctant, but apparently we weren't the only district that asked that, because when I talked to them last, they said, yeah, there's going to be an option for that. So that's the direction that we're looking to go with visual art. It should save us a lot of money on that and also give our teachers what they need. And they'll still have the Davis textbook that they've had as a reference all along. So that should be good for us financially. Um, in drama, there's only one company that has published anything. And they only published one book, 7 through 12. We went back to them and said, um, and, and the material is actually really good. We said, one of the problems is this is a hard textbook. and very soon, people are not going to be buying hard textbooks, and they were aware that that was a problem, but the fact that they're the only publisher, they don't see it as being an urgent problem. But they did see the fact that they only had one level as being an urgent problem, and as recently as today, one of their representatives has dropped me off some more materials by our office. I was in a training today, so I haven't had a chance to look at them, but they're looking at that. Um, so. We still need to see what we're going to do about drama on that. I would like to see more than one level because, you know, I've got my kids in drama. I don't want them to use the same textbook, 7th grade through 12th grade. It doesn't make any sense. Um, on, let's go to music because music is also a very large part of our fine arts. Um, in our performing uh, music ensembles, our band, choir, and orchestra, the biggest thing we use is sheet music. So, you know, a book is not, and everybody realizes that to the extent that nobody's publishing anything like that. One of the companies has put together a packet of all the UIL materials, which if we were opening a brand new school, 
I would say we have to buy this for this new school. This is absolute need. However, Brazosport High School, Brazoswood High School, LJI, these are older schools, and we have pretty substantial libraries there to where if we bought this, all it would be is a duplicate of what we already have. So that's the reason that we're not so much looking at that. The one thing that we are looking at that I'm extremely excited about is um, a Quaver is a publishing company that is publishing, and they've gone totally digital. You can't get a book from them at all. They've, they saw the future and realized what it was. And it is a, um, an elementary music curriculum for some just, you know, luck smiles on us. Uh, we hired a teacher from Angleton who was already using it, and so at Nay, we've are, we're already piloting the Quaver Music Program to see how it goes. My um, all of the elementary music teachers across the district have been looking at it since November, um, it, with very positive results. Quaver was the only publisher at the time that the state evaluated and that had anything ready, so they're the only people that are on the approved list. However, all of the usual suspects, when they saw that nobody else had anything out, they since then, McGraw-Hill and all the other people have published stuff, but there's a huge difference. Whenever you look at the Quaver stuff, I mean, it's interactive, it looks a whole lot like um, any other learning software you would see, and when you look at some of the other publisher stuff, it looks a whole lot like they took a picture of their textbook and put it on a screen. So, uh, Quaver is most likely the direction we are going to go. Um, this was confirmed this last week. We had Texas Music Educators Conference in San Antonio. And at that place, all of the major publishers had uh, displays. And without telling my music teachers anything, I said, I want you to go to every one and come back and tell me what you think. And every one of them was... Well, most of them just look like they took a picture of their textbook and put it on the screen, but this one's really exciting and looks fantastic. I said, good, that's kind of what I thought too. So that's basically where we are with fine arts. Um, and again, if you have any questions, I'll be here afterwards to answer anything you would like to ask. Kathleen. Uh, here you go. I'm Kathleen Lindsay. I'm the ELA coordinator, and that stands for English Language Arts and Reading. Uh, the English Language Arts and Reading had an adoption in 2010, and so we are not going through the process right now. We won't go through the process until 2018 for K-6 and 2019 for K, uh, excuse me, for 7th grade through 12th grade. So when we're looking at new instructional materials, there are lots of opportunities. When the state changed our funding to give us an, actually a pot of money, that gives us a lot of flexibility because even though they give us a recommended list, we get to make the decisions on what we want to buy with that money that we're given. Um, there's a lot of opportunities you've heard with all the digital resources that are being provided now. But there's also a challenge. Uh, Michael mentioned the pot of money is not as big as we would like that pot of money to be. It's limited. So we can't go out and buy everything that we want to buy, just like in our home budgets, we can't buy everything we want to buy. So that's why the coordinators and the teachers are going through a process with rubrics and looking at things to make the best determination for the best use of our money. Another challenge with all the wonderful digital resources is digital uh, devices to use those resources with. Um, and we have to think about not only if a child has, now if they have a textbook, they take that textbook home in their backpack. But if they have digital resources, they're going to need access at home for those digital resources. And we know that that's not necessarily the case in every household. So we've got to provide a way for those children to have access at home. So lots of opportunities and lots of challenges. So Sam? <laughs> now the time that the spotlight is on you. <laughs> Do you have any questions of anything that we've talked about that? I see where my tax money's going. I appreciate it. That's good. 
Uh, it's a process, and, and you have to start the process very early, and uh, we've done that, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to provide what we need. Now, yeah. as that pile of money is small, it's thin, it is thin yeah. but, you know, we may do as best we can. Uh, appreciate fine arts keeping those books and finding other things that are going to work, so we're really excited about that. Did anybody? I am. Nobody else but my eye. <laughs> Did anybody else have any other questions? Anything that they wanted to? Think? I would, I, one thing I left out or that I'd like to just uh, make clear is that we've been going through that review process. We have a district rubric uh, that te uh, I'm filling them out. Teachers are filling them out, and actually, at least for math and social studies, those are those rubrics are due from our teachers on Wednesday to us. And they ask questions of how well does this align with the standards, how well does this align to our different uh, curriculum goals and initiatives and our, our, our calendars that we use for our, uh, our units. Uh, but it also, how, how, how much does this help us uh, assess our kids, how much does it engage them. So there are a lot of things we're looking at, uh, and the teachers and groups of teachers are getting together uh, to review these materials. Once they get those rubrics to us in the next couple of days, uh, then our job is to start number crunching and thinking about how many students do we have in first grade? How many, how many of these resources am I going to need in first grade or fifth grade next year? And starting, start talking with the major publishers that we've kind of narrowed things down to. You know, maybe we had five publishers we were looking at and now with uh, teacher input we're really looking at two. And so getting proposals from them and, uh, and then we'll, we'll st sit in a room with a bunch of us and uh, look at the budget and look at the, our needs and look at our plans and prioritize and make those decisions with the goal, the timeline goal, uh, of taking that to the, the school board in April. And our school board expects us to basically get input from the public and to get input from teachers. So it's not, uh, we're not making choices that are just in isolation. It's not my department, although we're in force here, it's not just our department making those decisions. It has to be with the teachers, it has to be with the students. The students really enjoy our night with the publishers because they were able to rack up and just put things in so they have resources at home. So it's a really great opportunity for parents to come out because all of the materials that are there are free and they can take it at the end of the session. And sometimes before the end, they don't want to carry all that stuff. <laughs> okay, so do we have any other questions, concerns? Okay, Sam. <laughs> You're good. <laughs>